Okay. So we're going to welcome Stephanie Hill today to Scrum Masters of the Universe. Her topic is facilitation tips and tricks to increase team engagement. And uh, Stephanie is the owner of Light Bulb Moment Consulting, and she partners with organizations to really um, to optimize the, the intersection of purpose, people, and process to, to increase efficiency and effectiveness. And, and what does this do? This really helps improve customer and employee experience, greater profit, um, really positioning that organization for growth. She has 21 years of continuous improvement experience in legal, manu manufacturing, insurance, retail, government, and health. So she has been all over in terms of uh, lots of ex varied experience in, in different domains. Um, she's a Safe 5 Agilist. Um, she also has her strategic human resources uh, leadership. She's a master black belt in Lean Six Sigma. She's in chemistry and a master's in public health. Um, she currently lives in West Des Moines, um, Iowa until August, but then she will be moving back to her home state of Ohio. She's also a big fan of Lego sets, kayaking, traveling, and is actually finishing up her first book. So that sounds very exciting. So welcome, Stephanie. I am going to um, stop sharing and turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you for that introduction. And thank you for inviting me in the first place. I also want to thank the rest of you for welcoming me to your universe. Um, I think Scrum Masters of the Universe might be the best name I've ever heard. So kudos to whomever <laughs> came up with that. I don't know, Jamie, if that was you or a no, 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 no. That was a uh, the first original group. We were, I don't know, we were less than a hundred at the time, and and they all came up with names, and then we voted, and that's the one that won. That's awesome. It's a good name. Keep it. <laughs> all right. Um. So I, I want to go ahead and get started talking about facilitation. And um, the first thing I want to say is just that when you look at the word facilitate, the the root of it comes from the Latin meaning of making easy to make something easy. And so um, if you have done any facilitation in the past, you probably know that uh, the act of being a facilitator is anything but easy. So um, I thought I'd start off by just asking if you have had any struggles with facilitation, if there's any challenges that, that you faced or that you're concerned about facing, um, if you wanna just put a few words in the chat so that I have a sense of, of what challenges you might have. Engagement, hey, that's a good topic. Um, task, barriers, cultural differences. Okay. All right, I like it. Okay, so I wanted to just get a little bit of idea from you about what you're what you're all facing, because you know I created this presentation in a vacuum. You know, I didn't have all of the insights from you about what you what you need, what you uh, have, have been experiencing. So if I have the opportunity, I might take a little bit more time on certain topics, knowing what, what you're all sharing now. Um, get those muted, probably. Maybe someone needs to mute. Oh. OK. Um, so then uh, as at the end of it, though, we will have some time for question and answer. So if you want to you can either hold on to it or you could put it in the chat. And uh, Jamie said she'd be monitoring that for questions. OK, so I wanted to give this presentation um, and engage several of you to interact with this uh, presentation because I've been facilitating for over 21 years. And I also teach facilitation and coach others in facilitation. And along the way, I've, I've identified some tips and tricks that work really well, um, I think universally, whether it's uh, working with virtual environments or in-person environments, there's something that I'm gonna share today that could be used regardless of what, what you have for your audience. All right, so before we get too far, um, I do have like, two items that I would like you to have ready to go. Um, and so the first one is a loose sheet of paper. 
So if you have just, it can be a scrap paper, it can be blank, whatever, um, but just so that you can easily move it around and flip it over um, and write in the margins. And if you don't have that around, that's, that's cool. Um, you'll probably just have to watch for one of the exercises while some other people do the activity. All right, so as you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing um, my mural screen. And I guess before I do, I'll just let you know, I'm not being paid by mural. I'm gonna be using mural today, I'm not being paid by them. I think it's a great tool to use for virtual uh, audiences. I also like, um, I heard Miro, I think mentioned for maybe the, the session that's gonna to be tomorrow. Uh, I think that person's gonna be using some Miro, M-I-R-O. Um, I've used idea boards, which is totally free. And I use it for like brainstorming, voting, Kanban, things like that. Um, for mapping, I use Lucidchart and um, they have some awesome templates too. So there's a lot out there if you have virtual facilitation um, challenges and I just encourage you to explore and figure out what's gonna work best for you. Okay, that said, share my screen. Okay. All right, so we're gonna start with the agenda. And uh, the first thing I like to, let me, let me double check. Can you guys see the mural, Jamie? Okay. Um, so the first thing I always like to start with is the why. I think there's even a book about starting with the why. And um, I'll just talk about the why behind engagement. And I think it's pretty obvious, but I'll go over some just quotes uh, that we can, we can use for that. Um, next, we'll do some facilitation tips. Then we'll have uh, three interactive exercises, and then we'll finish up with question and answer. All right, so the why. So first of all, the purpose of team engagement. Um, happy, engaged teams do better work, are more collaborative and innovative, and deliver up to 50% better performance than less engaged teams. And we just, we think about engagement a lot as an organization. Um, there's lots of surveys and, you know, we, we always want to drive up higher engagement. Um, but this, this kind of spoke to me about team engagement and how when we're, we're really getting the people in the room involved, um, we're going to have better results for our projects that we do or whatever the mission is for the team that you're getting together. So that was from Business Insider. And then why facilitate interactive learning? So why you want to get people to be like hands-on, to be doing things as you go. Um, the first one from New School of Architecture Design said, students strengthen their critical thinking and problem solving skills using a much more holistic approach to learning. And then study.com said, barring sh severe shyness or anxiety, hands-on learning is uniquely positioned to support or elevate any type of learner. So we want to make sure that anything that we do can engage people regardless of their thinking style, regardless of their uh, background. So you want to be able to have an opportunity to do that. Um, and just so you know, I'm just going to pop over really quickly. I do have the link. So I'll be sharing the I'll be sharing this whole link of the mural with you in just a moment when I'm done talking about the, the tips. Um, but anything I discuss today, I'll probably have a link here so you can you can access it later. All right, so we're ready to jump over into facilitation tips. Okay, so the first one is about being prepared and adaptable. Um, I would say be prepared for anything. You know, no two events, no two teams, they're never the same. So you just wanna make sure you are prepared, but adaptable. And so when I prepare, it's kind of ridiculous because I have like minute by minute I don't round up to the five minute mark. It's like minute by minute, everything that we have planned. And yet I'm also switching on the fly, depending on how things are landing with the team, or if I learn more about their needs, I'll adjust. And so um, oddly being super prepared makes me feel more comfortable in making those adjustments as I go. Um, the next one is getting to know your audience. So even if it's just a short period of time, um, get acquainted with them. And just remember that facilitation is not about you. It's not about getting through your material. It's not about demonstrating how smart you are. It's not a one-sided performance. It is about the group. It's about the audience and adding value to them 
And like I said at the beginning, making something easier. So if you have a mission that your group is trying to achieve, it's about making that process easiest for them to do it as the facilitator. And so starting by learning what gaps people have and how they work is really helpful. Um, when I started the beginning of this conversation, I asked about your gaps and what kinds of things that you were experiencing, um, because I wanted to know if what I was gonna be sharing with you was gonna be helpful for you. There's one quote that I really like um, that my mentor, Steve Dickinson, used to say a lot. And he would say, facilitation is like dancing with a bear. Um, you can choose the music, you can choose the place, you can even choose the outfit you're gonna wear. But at the end of the day, it's the bear's dance. And so in that story, obviously you're the, you're the person picking out the music and everything, but the bear is the group that you're working with. And so you just kind of got to go with that flow and, and see how it's going to work. Okay. Um, the next one is demonstrating, demonstrating and managing respect for all people. And Jamie talked a little bit about, at the beginning about um, my background in lean um, and continuous improvement. And so one of the pillars of lean is respect for people. And I add the word respect for all people because I want to ensure that we're emphasizing the fact that there is no one in the room who deserves more respect than anyone else, whether it's from you or from the people around them. And I think we often make a mistake of assuming that the person with the highest level in the organization gets more, you know, more of a spotlight, gets more airtime, um, and that's not the case. And even if they are the decision maker in the room, we really don't want them making the decision without making sure that the voices in the room are heard. Um, when I say the word room, I want to be clear that I mean whether it's virtual or physical, it doesn't have to be the actual room. Um, and that it's your job to manage all of this. If you're the type of person who, who like thinks about the work and says, I just want to focus on the work. I don't want to, I don't want to look at the people stuff. That's kind of a distraction, you know, like if that's how, kind of how you see it, just know that your outcome <clears throat> will be subpar if you're not focused on the psychological safety of the people in the room. You wanna make sure that they're really comfortable as quickly as possible, sharing how they work, any barriers that they're facing, <clears throat> and even if they're not totally committed to executing once you leave the room, you wanna make sure that they're comfortable sharing all of that or else you could have problems. All right, um, the next tip is a just-in-time training. So anytime you're gonna have the group do an activity, you wanna make sure you do just-in-time training. And I find that the most successful is when it includes explanation, demonstration, practice, and then examples or stories. <clears throat> so the first one, ex explanation, that's about what the team will do, why they will do it, where it fits in the context of other things that they're gonna be doing, and then how they do it. <clears throat> and I think that it's, obvious, you know, most of those st steps that I just described, but the context part, I had to learn the hard way, I would say. So for instance, if I were doing, again, this is a lean thing, but if I were doing a mapping session <clears throat> where I'm going to be learning improvements and all that about a process, I used to have problems where people would, instead of just telling me what they do and sharing the what, they would want to share the problem with the what every single step that we took. So I do this and it's always a challenge because blah, 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 you know, and, and it would always kind of derail the step we were in right then. So I learned that if I tell them, okay, right now we're going to do mapping and in mapping, we're trying to capture what it is that you do. The step after this, we're going to talk about barriers that you face related to mapping. So for, for now, there's a piece of paper in front of you because I prepared for this, um, where you can write down any thoughts you have that might relate to the barriers, but we're going to focus mainly on the what right now. And so that helps them to really, it's almost freeing up their mind to really get um, engaged with what they're doing with the team right then and there. Uh, the next one is demonstration of what they're going to be doing. And that's just simply modeling it, showing them a quick example. Um, and then that's going to be followed by practice. So giving them the opportunity to do like a mini version of it, um, to something that's a, a really low risk trial where you can give some feedback and make sure they get it. And then examples, um, 
you can either use your own examples of how this is applied, or if you don't have a lot of experience with it, you can also talk about what other people have experienced. Uh, and I like to talk about stories that illustrate the learnings. Um, so like I, I always tell a squirrel story, I'll probably mention that again later, where I have this little, if I'm in person, I have a little squirrel called Frank, a stuffed squirrel, and I use it to like manage distractions. But I begin with a silly little story about a squirrel. And when you tell a story that's seemingly unrelated, it gets the brain working to make connections. And when the brain is working to make connections, it's sticking a little bit more than if it weren't doing that. So stories serve a really good purpose um, to get somebody to retain the information and understand. Okay, let's see. Next, we're gonna go to just capturing information. There's gonna be a lot where you hear something and you need to write it down. Um, again, I just talked about mapping. So that's quick, like writing and writing and writing everything that you hear. And so when I do this, I, I follow this order. Ask the right questions, listen and write, perform a logic check and bring to closure. So the first one is of ask the right questions. Um, this means you're not asking closed questions. You're not asking yes or no questions. And you're not asking questions to lead people. Like you shouldn't have an agenda that you're trying to push them through and saying it's a question, but asking questions truly with the intent to understand what happens. And then that goes to the next one, which is listening and writing without filtering. A lot of times when people hear somebody talking, especially talking a lot, they'll say, well, let me paraphrase, or I'm going to wordsmith that, or something along those lines. And that can break down trust. So the Best thing to do is if you're hearing somebody talk, picking out the words that they're saying and putting exactly what they're saying onto your paper, your sticky note, whatever it is that you're working with. Um, and the reason is that if they see the words they say coming out of their mouth, put on a piece of paper, they understand that they can trust you, that you hear them, that you've, you've listened, you've written what they've said, and that you're not trying to adjust something they said to fit your own bias or whatever the case, because if they see that you're changing their words, they're going to be less, they're going to be less um, trusting, they're going to be less um, open to talking about what they experienced because they feel like it wasn't good enough. So it's important to write what they say. So the next one about performing logic check, um, that is after you have written what they said. And sometimes I get so like, it's very bizarre when I'm facilitating because it's almost like I just like listen, right, listen, right. If somebody beside the person talking says something about a squirrel, like the word squirrel can can get in there somehow. Then I do a logic check after I've written and I go back and say like, mm, that didn't really make sense. And then I'll double check that. Or maybe the order of the steps didn't make sense. And so I'll check on that as well. Um, and then the last one is bring to closure. So once I've written something down, then I just reread it and just make sure, yep, it's good. And then I move on to the next step. Okay, so then um, this next one really re relates to like when you're in a in-person setting. So this is the use of flip charts. <clears throat> and so a lot of this is around legibility and being able to find things when you need them. Uh, the first is to alternate colors. So when you're writing like every other, write every other color um, by line. So if you're hanging up flip charts and you've been in the room for a long time together, and somebody's trying to find some things they said, they're just going to look out and see a sea of black if they've just used black marker the whole time. But if it's alternated even like black and green or whatever, they can pick out the words a lot faster. Um, so that's a handy way to find things. The next one is using red for accent. Um, and that's similar, but if you really want a word or a phrase to stand out, then if you only use red for those purposes, that is um, a handy way to do that. Obviously, you don't want to use light colors because they're hard to see from a distance. And write legibly, which includes like legibly spelling correctly, a good size, um, and sure everybody can see it. If you're not great at spelling or if you get hung up on a word, um, ask the team. They will be more than happy to help you spell it. If you spell something incorrectly, um, people like me, unfortunately, will get hung up on it. And I mean, we can just get like stuck looking at that word and you will have moved on and we'll just be like thinking about that word and getting annoyed that it's it's wrong. Um, so that, I, that is a personal flaw, but I mean, I don't think I'm alone in that. Um, so then the other one is hanging up all flip chart paper. 
So kind of like I talked about the trust thing with listen and write, you also want to send the message that what people said was important. So if you put it down on the paper, then it's important enough to keep it in front of them. Once you flip it over, once you've covered it up with another flip chart paper, whatever, um, you're telling them that it's no longer important that we've moved on. So you wanna make those visible. And then the last thing is um, to address difficult behaviors directly but tactfully. Um, I like to, like I, I said, I have a scroll story. You can contact me later if you wanna hear the scroll story, but I like to start with that because it prevents the difficult, some of the difficult behaviors later. So that talks about distractions, showing up late, um, a variety of those kinds of things. And it makes it fun and it makes it interactive with the group. Um, but as you're going in through facilitating, you can't prevent all of the behaviors you're going to face. And so you can do things like using your body language, um, well, that's hard to do virtually, um, but there's just different ways that you can address it. However, the most difficult behavior can be being, can be withdrawing. And so I think that the assumption is that when you hear somebody who's critical and just boisterous and all that, um, that those are the, the hardest ones. And I don't think that's true because if you are if you've been facilitating for a bit, you know that as soon as you hear that or see that, um, you have to address it right away, right? So you take a break, you talk to the person directly or whatever you need to do to, to handle that. What you often miss, especially in a virtual setting, is those people who aren't saying anything at all. And if they're withdrawing, you have no idea what's going on behind their eyes. You know, are they, are they checked out? Um, do they secretly hate this whole thing that you're doing? And as soon as you walk out of the room, they're gonna sabotage it. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns there, and it's really important to draw out what somebody who is withdrawn feels. And so whether you can, you know, get them involved um, during the event, during the meeting, um, great, do that. And if not, you know, if you want to have a conversation with them offline, um, do that as well outside of the meeting. So just if you're like, what I find that if you're in the room or even virtually, I'll oftentimes have them do like an independent exercise where they're writing their thoughts on a sticky note or they're doing something like an idea board or something alone before I have them talk out loud because that gives them the chance to just put their opinions and ideas down on paper first. And sometimes that can address their withdrawing uh, nature. So before we move on, Stephanie, we did have one question going back to the, to the flip chart. Um, some were asking, um, do you do the same color alternation with remote facilitation? Or how can you adapt that that tip to remote to the remote environment and how you're creating your material using mural, for example, instead of flip charts? Um, yeah, so like for this example where I'm sharing my mural screen, I am using multiple colors on my stickies. So the font, I just kept all the same. Well, I guess it's white and black now that I look at it. Um, so I did alternate it that way. And in my emails, um, a lot of times I will use the concept of like highlighting certain things, a certain color. I don't necessarily um, alternate colors. I will more like skip lines, you know, like make it a little bit easier to read. But just anything that I'm doing where, whether it's in person or, um, virtually, I do think about how it's going to be like perceived by the reader and try to figure out ways to make that as easy as possible. Virtual is kind of nice too, because you can do other things like bold, underline, you know, there's a lot more um, italicized like flexibility with fonts and things. So um, you can do that too. Did that cover it? All right, so at this time, I am going to bring you in, let's see, by sharing my link with you. Let's see. Okay, so if you wanna go ahead and click on the link, you can join me in the mural. Um, if you haven't used mural before, just hit enter as visitor and you can pop on in. I'm seeing some little fun icons at the bottom. Tell me you're showing up. Um, so once I have some more of you in there, we'll, we'll get started. 
but I'm going to be summoning you soon. Wait till there's more. I'll be summoning you, which essentially brings you all to the screen that I'm seeing. If at any point you get lost or you're not, you didn't follow me from the beginning, you can also hover over my um, little SH thing at the bottom and you can just click to follow me. If you are on your own out there and you want to just explore, that is cool. But just know that um, if you want to zoom in or out, then at the bottom here, we have this little plus sign for out or for in and then the negative for out. Um, you can also usually have, there's usually something on your mouse that allows you to do the same thing. If you accidentally do something, like if you double click, um, that'll bring up a sticky note. I seem to do that all the time. Um, so just click off of it and hit control Z and that'll take it out. Or you can hit this little undo um, back arrow at the top left. Okay, so let me summon y'all. You might want to um, show them how to hide the cursor. Yeah, on a webinar now, but what's up? Don't have all of the uh, take a so that you don't have all the floating cursors. I don't know how to do that. Do you know how to do that? Oh, show cursors. Yep, there's a. On, yeah. I did it. I just. <laughs> I did it. So everybody. everybody would have to do that for themselves. Oh, I see. Yeah. So if you if you hover over your um, icon where it says show cursors, there's a checker. It, it should check or check off of that. Is that how it looks on yours? Okay. Um, so is everybody seeing the same thing as I am? Just going to guess yes. Okay. So we're going to start with 5S. And so these examples are going to be um, related to lean. Um, that's obviously what I do a lot, uh, but think about how they can be applicable to what you do um, day to day. So it could be, you know, both at home or in the, in the work setting. Um, so 5S creates an organize, organized system that enables people to see if anything is missing or in the wrong place. It helps with safety, inventory management, defect reduction, decreasing waste of time, reducing frustration, creating a discipline that's useful for all areas of continuous improvement. We have created, we have adapted five S's in the US from Japanese terms that we now say as sort, set and order, shine, standardize and sustain. And so to share with you my own personal story. Um, so my, my younger son has autism and getting him to put his clothes away, like a way that's gonna work just had been a battle for the longest time. And so, we tackled that. Um, I, first, I tried like getting him to hang up clothes. He was really frustrated and getting angry. Uh, we tried to do like folding, couldn't figure that out. And so I ended up, um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the, the brand 31, um, but I went to a 31 party and I got these containers here on the right made. And so um, I had it so that they were set up sort of from top to bottom. So like the hats on top, pants on the bottom. And so you could kind of sense like where things were gonna go even if you didn't look at the labels. And I did have like fun little robots and stuff embroidered onto it. And so we had this little system going and he, we, you know, 5 s his, his room and he was keeping this this way on his own. So it was really nice. Um, so I, the other thing I just wanted to add with this is that know your audience, get to know your audience. I mentioned that a few times, but we, no matter what we're doing, so if it's 5S, if it's a new project, whatever the case is, think about their system, think about their working style and what works for them and make sure that you're creating a solution that fits their needs. Um, and so that was really helpful with my son when we, when we learned that. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to do an activity with you that I'll show this first part. Um, so just to kind of let you know what it's going to be, we're going to be moving tiles from the area below that I haven't shown yet. We're going to be moving them into this white, these white squares, and you're going to spell out Scrum Master with an exclamation point at the end of it and seeing how much you can get done in 15 seconds. In the real world, I do this with Scrabble tiles. 
and set up multiple stations and do a whole thing with it. Um, but I've been doing this virtually. I also saw Lean Portland has one. So Lean Portland, I think I have a link to them as well. Um, but they have different activities that are even like on cell phones. So you could even do this on somebody's phone. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get started with this by, I think I need three volunteers. So if you wanna volunteer type 5S into the chat and we'll take the first three people. Stephanie, who did you mention was, had activities like this? What'd you say? Who did you mention also had activities like this? Oh, Lean Portland. Lean Portland? L-E-A-N Portland, yes. like Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, well, okay, we got our three. So the first one we'll, we'll have is Naomi. And then is it Patrili? I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, and then the third one is Magda. Okay, so for this first part, everybody, you know, try not to touch the sticky notes. I don't know how to prevent you from doing it, but try not to touch the sticky notes unless you are Naomi. All right, so Naomi, um, again, we're gonna have you moving the tiles up to this area and spell out Scrum Master with an exclamation point. All right, is that, well, I probably, you probably can't answer, but all right, I'm going to show you these tiles now and let me get my clock ready to start. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. Oh, I gotta fix that. Oh, time's up. All right. So we got we got four. Is one of them behind, or did we get that fixed? All right. So we got four. Not too bad, but we'll we'll just keep that in mind. Um, I'm gonna move up to the next one. So thank you for participating, Naomi. Um, we're gonna do the exact same thing in each round. Um, so this time, um, Patrili, I don't know if I'm saying it right, I hope I am, and I apologize if I'm not, um, but I'm going to reset the, reset the clock, and on your mark, get set, go. Uh-oh, time's up. Do, Patrili, do we have you ready to go? I am, but I'm having a problem navigating on my phone. <laughs> oh, sorry, you, you were I doing it on your know. phone. Okay. Do you, yeah, what, should we move up phone. to do you want me to move up to Magna? Magda and have Yeah, oh, it might be difficult to do this on the phone. Okay, who it is. Who's doing this over here? Yeah, leave that back alone. All right. So that was four. The first <laughs> one was four. All right. Let's have uh, Magda do the second round. All right, on your mark, get set. Magda, go. Okay, time's up. All right, so we're not checking defects today, but there we go. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop with that one for there. So that's a lot better from the last one. Okay, we're gonna jump back down to the third one. And I think, uh, Naomi, we're gonna give you one more shot there. So um, are you ready to do round three? Uh, okay. Where, where is, okay, yes, now I'm ready. I got Sorry. it hidden. We're ready to go. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. And you're just moving them up to the white tiles. Awesome. I'm, I fixed that. Oh, okay. I was say I would fix that S, but that's okay. All right. So, um, 
assuming we only had four up here. <laughs> Let's talk about what happened each time. So when we did the first round, um, this was just kind of a lot of clutter, right? You just had all these letters all over the place and it took a while, I'm guessing, for Naomi to find what she needed to move it up. Um, I also intentionally hid this phrase scrum master so that she consciously had to think about it each time she moved her tiles up. Um, and so when you think about what environment you're working in, you need to be thinking, what, what are they dealing with? So are they dealing with files that are all over the place, um, materials that are all over the place, whatever the case is, there is a huge amount of productivity lost in the United States or really probably whatever country you're in um, because of people looking for things and spending time doing that instead of doing the actual value added work. So this is just an activity to demonstrate that. And we're gonna jump over to the next one, which is one piece flow. Okay, so for this one, I actually need seven volunteers. And so um, if you wanna volunteer for this, put one PC into the chat. Don't be shy. It'll be painless, I promise. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I'm, I'm counting on you, Stephanie. Oh gosh, I'll try really hard. Come on, three more. Ah, uh, there we go. And I don't know what one I'm more young. One more. You get the bozo button today if you put. Hey, L Young, would you uh, type what your first name is into the chat? Lisa, okay. I think we got them all right. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. See, so now we, have, now we have eight. Oh, never mind. We don't. Lisa was just giving us her name. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna give you your number. So remember your number, folks. So Anusha, you're uh, number one. James, you're number two. Progress, you're number three. Maria, number four. Kate, five. Lisa, six. And Natia is seven. Again, I apologize. You can tell me at the end of this if I botched up your name, so I'm sorry. Um, and so this is one piece flow. Um, and so, the thing about one piece flow is that we're talking about advancing one unit of work through a process at a time. And I think what you probably all do is really one piece flow work. Like you're, you're all hands on deck, getting something through and getting it done. Um, however, batch, batch working um, can cause a lot of problems. And I ask, like I work with a, an immigration law firm and I ask the teams to think about each case as a human, as a human being waiting. So anytime you put it into a pile, into a, you know, a waiting email or whatever, that's something waiting. And so we wanna to try to do one piece flow. So this activity I actually learned um, through Scaled Agile. And the way we're gonna do it is that um, player one's gonna start by moving one of these into section one. And player two will not begin until everything is filled in in section one. Okay, and once everything is filled in in section one, then the next player is going to take them and move them over. And we're just going to keep doing this until the last person puts them into the done section. Okay. All right, let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to get my stopwatch started. Okay, so the first person who is up is Anusha. And on your mark, get set, go. Okay, then we're going to have James moving them over. Grab them, James. There you go. Progress is on deck, so when this is over, progress. All right, next. Switching up the order, I like it. 
out of the box thinking. Um, we have Maria as the next one. You there, Maria? Oh, how'd that? Oh, clever. All right, then we've got Kate moving them one at a time. Please move one at a time. Kate, are you there? All right, I'm gonna be Kate. Sorry, moving them over. All right, then the next one on deck is Lisa. Okay, now Lisa, there you go. And finally, we got Natia. Keep going, keep going. Okay, stopping it there. Okay, awesome, thank you. So we had um, the first one was 219. The last one, was, oh, sorry, the first one was 202. And the last one was 219. Oh my word. Um, Kate, are you there? Sorry. And a time instruction. I don't think I gave that instruction, Maria. It's not your fault. Um, but yeah, going forward, we'll just do one at a time. And did we hear from Kate? I don't know if I, I took her turn, so I apologize. I don't think we've heard from her. Do we need a we need a one more person? Oh, she couldn't get a oh, first. Okay. Is it working now, Kate? No. Okay. Um, okay. One more volunteer that can take uh, Kate's place. I want to jump in there for us. Jamie, maybe you could be the next Kate. You'd be number five after <laughs> Maria. Okay. Um, so for the next, oh, Mansi. Okay. So Mansi, you're going to be number five right after Maria. Okay, so the next time we do this, we're gonna do the one piece flow version. So last one was batch. So we waited till everything was done and then we moved it over. This one's gonna be one piece flow. So as soon as the first one is moved into section one, then the next person moves it to section two and so forth. So you're just gonna move them one at a time through the process. Okay, so um, Anusha is gonna go first. So let me get my clock started here. All right, on your mark, get set, go. Okay, Anusha first, then James is second. So James, as soon as you can, you pull it over to your section two. Ah. Well, maybe, maybe we should start over and- Let's start over. Yeah. James, you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, so James, as soon as one dot goes into the section one, you move it into your section. Oh, right. Don't wait for and, all six. And then okay. for section three, once you see the first dot in section two, you can go ahead yep. and start and so on and so forth. Yep. Okay, let's start over. So, um, Anusha, you ready? And go. Okay, James, you can grab that one. There you go. And then as soon as, um, so progress, you can start pulling yours down. And let's see, Maria's next. You can start pulling yours over from section three. Maria, you gotta be moving yours over to your section, there you go. And then uh, Mansi, start pulling them to section five. And then Lisa to section six. And then Nikia uh, through into done.
I'm just going to stop it there. I don't know how there's a straggler in number three. We're just going to stop it. Okay. So uh, what we found in this last one is that we had um, the first the first one appeared at 40, sorry, I should choose zero, 42, 42 seconds. And then the last one showed at, it's okay. And then the last one showed at 58 seconds. So this was showed as done, right? Yes. So basically like, when you look at the comparison, the very first one that into the, went into the last done section was at two minutes and two seconds. When we did the one piece flow, the very first one showed up at 42 seconds, huge improvement. But even the last one, so the last one filled that box at two minutes and 19 seconds. When we did it as one piece flow, the last one got there at 58 seconds. So people always think I'm being more efficient when I just batch stuff and then hand it off to the next person. But this is a great demonstration to show like, no, because if you think of them all as people waiting on the other end of it, um, yeah, it doesn't happen. Um, so I don't think we have time to go through the name game. Um, so I might just tell you how to do it really quickly. And it, it's pretty cool because it works well each time. Um, and so the name game is essentially a way to drive home the point of what happens outside the room at the end of the process or at the end of the event, at the end of the project. And they're all gung ho and ready to go implement something. And what they'll find is that it's clunky at first. It takes longer. It's more cumbersome possibly. And there's a bunch of people outside of the team who have to enable it to, to make it work. And so it just gives people a realistic sense of that. And so the way that I do this is it's timed and I have, and so the sheet of paper, so I'm really sorry that we didn't get to it to practice, but the way that you would do it is you have them print their name on each of the four sides of the paper and you time it for like how long it takes for everybody to do it. Then you have them flip over their paper and do a second round where it's 50% of the work so they take out every other letter of their name and they write it, they print it. And it always takes almost double the time as the first time around. And then the third time they do it, you leave the paper the way they had it and you have them redo it a second time. And so you drive home the point that anytime you're going to implement something, you wanna make sure people have the resources they need to be successful. You wanna give them a chance to practice it and give them anything that can make it easier, like a template or whatever the case is. And so that helps with the change management side of things. Okay, so I showed you the helpful links and um, there's also a place on here where you can get in touch with me. If you do reach out, um, let me know that it was through Scrum Masters of the Universe so I know how we got connected. And are there any questions? <laughs> um, there. Hi. Um, this is a very great section. So thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, my question basically is with Mura, because this is like my first interaction with the platform. So these games, they look awesome. Are these like um, templates already or do you have to build them yourself from, from the scratch? I made them all from scratch. Um, there are templates out there and I honestly find some of them really hard to use, um, but it's better than nothing. Like if you're, if you're intimidated by it, um, go ahead and start with one of their pre-made templates and go from there. Um, but yeah, I, I just make these on my own. They're pretty straightforward, I would say, once you get to know it. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? I'm not seeing anything else. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, oh, we have one. Do we have time for one more question? That's, I think so. It's 11.59. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Stephanie. Nitigya this side. Thank you very much for the great session uh, and showing us these uh, great uh, um, I think exercises. One question like uh, about the events, right? Uh, the scrum events when we do. So how to drive engagement and understand these games, right? Uh, to drive 
engagement within the team or the stakeholders but in the events where we are not getting much participation any tips for uh, making it more engaging and people uh, have people speak up yeah and if and if anybody has to go thank you so much i appreciate you uh listening and being engaged um and so my my response to you is a couple things so first of all understanding the why um behind the lack of engagement because sometimes it's that you know people are introverted or sometimes if the group is too large they feel uncomfortable um talking or it could be a cultural um uh, concern about risk you know and, and retaliation if they're wrong you know like all these kinds of things and so if you have time and ability to go into that, go for it. Um, but the other thing, like I mentioned earlier, is when you can use something where they individually write um, uh, their thoughts or responses, you collect them. And even if it's anonymous, um, you collect them and then present it as like kind of a, a conglomeration, I guess, of everything, and then talk through all of it together as a team. Um, Sometimes that just at least helps get their ideas on paper and out in the open, even if they don't feel comfortable talking out loud. Right. So providing various ways of engagement. Mm -hmm. Yep. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank sure. You. All right. Well, we are right at the hour. So Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today at Scrum Masters of the Universe. It was definitely enlightening, and I think I'll steal some of these ideas that you've presented today so and sure. apply them. Uh, many of them apply um, to Scrum, um, even, even the concepts of whip, for example, um, and not having too much whip and the idea of waste. And uh, there are waste in software development, so things like that. Um, right. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, have a wonderful rest of your week. And we hope to see you again at, at Scrum Masters of the Universe. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jamie, are we going to get this video on YouTube? Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Thanks, everyone, again. Thanks, Stephanie. And uh, Katrin, thank you. Oh, it looks like she might be gone already. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> All right. Have a great day, everyone. Or evening, wherever you're at.